Merry Christmas, everyone, and I have no idea why I'm wearing a Christmas hat when I'm talking about something Star Wars related, which has nothing to do with Christmas at all. I think I just wanted to say Merry Christmas to you all and Happy Holidays, so I finally got around to seeing Rogue One a second time. So this will be my spoiler-filled review. If you've not seen Rogue One yet, go out and see it, go see my spoiler-free review, and then come back and watch this video. So for those who have seen it, I want to talk about a few select things in the movie that uh, I didn't mention beforehand, or just straight up spoilers that I couldn't talk about. Uh, but first, I just wanted to say, um, I think we all heard what happened with Carrie Fisher. She had a heart attack, went into cardiac arrest on a flight back from London. And um, I mean, we had a scare, and I'm glad to hear that she's doing all right. Recent reports have said that she's now in a stable condition, and that really does show that the Force is strong with her. The ability to kill off celebrities in the year of 2016 appears to be insignificant next to the power of the Force. Let's just, let's just move on. Let's talk about Rogue One. First off, I want to talk about a character that I didn't mention in my initial review for the movie, which is Chirrut, who's played by the IP man himself, Donnie Yen. He's this spiritual warrior who believes in the Force, and he always has this saying, the Force is with me, I'm one with the Force. The Force is with me, I'm one with the Force. The Force is with me, I'm one with the Force. And I'm really ashamed that I forgot to mention him because he's actually one of my favorite characters next to Jin Erso, Krennic, and K2SO. Huh? Because, because what I like about him is he's a character that presents a new aspect on how to wield the Force. He's someone who's not a Jedi, but he's still able to tap into the Force and use it towards his advantage. Some people have said that the Force controls him, or that he's just somebody else who's a Force wielder, but in a different manner, not necessarily in the way we're familiar with when it comes to Jedi. Yeah. But he was a really great character, and he had some really fun moments as well. Now let's talk about spoilers. One thing that did kind of get a little too much for me were the cameos by certain characters. In the Battle of Scarif up in space, we have Red Leader and Gold Leader, which was actually unused footage from A New Hope that they managed to clean up and put into the movie. Personally, I didn't think it looked that seamless. It just seemed a bit weird. But the cameos from those two, I didn't mind too much because... Since this movie takes place right before A New Hope, it just makes sense that they would appear in the Battle of Scarif. And I also really like how Red Leader calls out Red Five, who gets blown up. And we all know that position is now open to Luke, who eventually takes the name Red Five. Those cameos, I didn't mind too much. The other cameos that kind of bothered me were the ones by C-3PO and R2-D2. It's just for a few seconds uh, on the Yavin base uh, when the Rebels are headed towards Scarif. Uh, and... I mean, it's always cute to see C-3PO and R2-D2 together. At the same time, if you cut that out of the movie, nobody would have really missed it. And then there was another cameo that made me go, Oh yeah! Why are you two in the movie? I don't really hate these cameos, it's just I found them to be unnecessary. And those were the cameos by Dr. Evazan and Pondo Baba. You know, he doesn't like you. I don't like you either. We're wanted men. I have the death sentence on 12 systems. Those guys from the Moss Eisley Cantina in The New Hope, huh? they appear on Jetta. One of them bumps into Jyn Erso, and he's about to start some problems. And it was just like, okay, that was there. Didn't need to be there. The cameos weren't awful. They weren't really painful or anything, but they were cameos where if you'd cut them out of the movie, no one would have missed them. The excuse for having Red Leader and Gold Leader, I can understand, but C-3PO, R2-D2, Dr. Evazan, and Pondo Baba didn't really need to be in there. They could have been cut out and nobody would have really cared. Now, one cameo, or not really cameo, just more like small supporting role that should not have been in the movie at all was Tarkin. In this movie, they have recreated Governor Tarkin, played by Peter Cushing in A New Hope, uh, through the use of CGI. Uh, and I knew Tarkin was going to be in this movie because one of the TV spots, or stills, revealed the back of Tarkin's head. And I thought, okay, it would be cool if they showed the back of Tarkin's head. But he's in it for a while. And when I first saw the movie, I was like, wow, that actually looks Kind of cool. It's a pretty cool effect. CG has sure come a long way since young Jeff Bridges in Tron Legacy, which that still creeps me out. But then I saw the movie again in IMAX on a true eight-story IMAX screen at CityWalk. And when CGI Tarkin popped up, I was like, oh my god, that thing does not look good. Because the big 
thing about IMAX is that it makes everything bigger. And in Tarkin's case, it makes it bigger to a fault. You can just really tell that he's a CG effect. Uh, and it's just distracting. Like, you could have done one of two things. You could have either just had Tarkin speak off screen. Uh, and we all know it's him. We all know... We as Star Wars fans all know who Tarkin is. Or give Tarkin's role to Darth Vader. Because with the little amount of time Tarkin is in this movie, having Darth Vader in that role would not have ruined his presence throughout the movie. But CG Tarkin just doesn't work out too well. There is a CG Princess Leia at the very end of the movie, which it's weird in the sense that we just saw Leia in The Force Awakens when she's much older, but it didn't really bother me as much as it did Tarkin. CG Tarkin is just bizarre. I mean, I wonder how he's going to look when I see the movie on Blu-ray again, because on a big, giant, eight-story IMAX screen, he looks weird, but maybe he'll look different on home video. Now, I mentioned Darth Vader. I think we all knew that Darth Vader was going to be in this movie. How long he was going to be in this movie was anyone's guess. I was hoping he wasn't going to be in the movie for very long. And he appears in two scenes, probably about as much as I imagined he'd be in the movie, but his scenes are really great. The first scene is when director Krennic visits him in his giant castle on what we assume is Mustafar because it is a lava planet. However, it looks a little more like Sullust than it does Mustafar. But anyway, he has a conversation with director Krennic about how the Senate and the galaxy as a whole cannot know about the Death Star, how the destruction of Jetta City was because of a mining accident. It's a really brief scene, but I think it really does capture the essence of Vader's presence and just how feared he can be because we see director Krennic talking back to Tarkin, yelling at him. But when he's around Vader, who is not of a higher rank as Tarkin, you see the fear in Krennic's eyes, his voice. And my favorite part of that scene is when he tries to get Vader's approval if he can reclaim the Death Star as his own and not Tarkin's, to where Vader decides to force choke him and says, be careful not to choke on your aspirations, director. And it is a pun, yes, but I think it really works and once again demonstrates Vader's true menace and James Earl Jones' voice still works. There is no other voice that can top James Earl Jones in terms of Darth Vader. And then we get to the last scene of the movie with Darth Vader in it, obviously. Darth Vader arrives just at the end of the Battle of Scarif once the Rebels have gotten the plans. He boards the giant ship that has the plans and... We have a bunch of rebels trapped in a hallway with a jammed door. The lights are out, and Darth Vader comes in with his lightsaber ignited, and he starts deflecting all the blaster fire, force chokes some of the rebel soldiers, slices them up. It's just so badass. It makes you forget about, no! And what I really love is how it's told from the perspective of the rebels' point of view. The rebels are in fear of Darth Vader. Uh, one of them is just like slamming on the jammed door saying, help us. And at the point where he's the last guy standing, he has the plans and he's like, here, take it, take it. And then Darth Vader impales him. And then the other rebels manage to escape successfully on board the Tantive Four, where they give the plans to Princess Leia and then A New Hope begins there. It's a really fantastic final scene. And seeing Darth Vader just deflect all the blaster fire away, using the force to pull their weapons away, force choke them, pull up up in the air just before cutting them with his lightsaber. It's something that I've always wanted to see out of Darth Vader for the longest time. It's right up there in terms of really badass scenes with the warehouse scene in Batman vs Superman. I mean, that's a shitty movie, no question about that, but I will always defend the warehouse scene. And this Vader scene at the end is just as epic. So the last real thing I have to say is that all the characters die in the movie. All of the main characters uh, die. All the members of this Rogue One group die in the end. Jin Erso, Captain Andor, K2SO, Chirrut, they all die at the end. Which makes me really wish that I had cared for these characters a little more because both times watching it, I just didn't really feel a whole lot. And I think one of the aspects of that is that there's really 
no true camaraderie between these characters. If you go back and watch The Force Awakens, when Poe and Finn steal that TIE fighter, there's a friendship that just blooms right there. And then soon after Rey and Finn escape Jakku, you could tell that there's dynamic right there, that another friendship is formed. So the chemistry between all the characters in The Force Awakens is handled much better than it is here in Rogue One, huh? which is a real bummer because I still really do like this movie. Yeah? Watching it a second time, I actually do like it a little better because I knew what the progression of the movie was. But I can't say it's better than The Force Awakens. There are a lot of people that are loving the hell out of this, loving it more than The Force Awakens. I can't pull myself to do that just on the aspect that I didn't really care a whole lot about the characters in this one. I still like them all. I'll still stand by my statement in my spoiler-free review that I like them, but I just didn't really feel any emotional attachments when they all died, huh? So I don't have much else to say about Rogue One. It's really good. It's a really good movie. I do love the different tone it has for a Star Wars movie. I love how it's more of a war film, whereas all the other previous films... Uh, the original trilogy and The Force Awakens, mainly, were science fiction fantasies. I mean, I'll definitely be buying this movie on Blu-ray, but I don't outright love it. If I had to rank this, I would probably say it's my fifth favorite Star Wars movie. Before Rogue One, it's Empire Strikes Back, A New Hope, Force Awakens, and Return of the Jedi. Still a really good movie that's worth seeing in your lifetime, but I don't outright love it. But I am excited for Episode 8 and the future of other Star Wars spin-off films. And that's my spoiler review for Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. I hope you all enjoyed it. Hope you're all having a great Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Leave a comment down below and tell me what your thoughts are on the spoilers for Rogue One. And as always, this is The Real Mr. Robinson telling you there is only one.